This evening we will be talking about the subject, the Muslims' end of days. And I would invite you to come back and be a part of that. It is a very interesting lesson and also a lesson that explains a lot about what is happening in our world at this present time. It is somewhat connected to our previous lesson on the caliphate, and we'll talk about that a little bit more this evening. So if you can, uh, come back and invite someone to be a part of our uh, lesson on the Muslim end of days. I hope all of you had a merry, merry Christmas. I am always amazed that uh, uh, Christmas comes and goes so quickly, and uh, we get so many things. Folks, so oftentimes we consider ourselves a very poor people, and it just amazes me uh, how many people are at Walmart, how many people at Target, and all these other stores just buying up like crazy, and uh, the restaurants are constantly full, and yet we're just as poor as we could possibly be, and that's just not true, is it? We are very rich. And we are very blessed. And I thank God for that. But I hope that we'll use those blessings to His glory as well. Marriage is a divine institution. We read about it in Genesis, the second chapter, when God overcame the loneliness of man. God created Eve and brought her unto Adam, and He said, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. And shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Genesis 2, verse 24. Satan knows that marriage is a divine, holy institution. And Satan is going to do all in his power to try to destroy that institution. He's going to do all that he can to harm our homes. He's going to do all that he can to tear two individuals apart. He's going to do everything that he possibly can do to make our marriages fail. And in the process, he's going to harm as many individuals as he can. The husband, the wife, and the children that are in that marriage. In addition, he is going to bring harm too to the families of those who are involved in a marriage that ends in divorce. Satan has numerous, numerous avenues by which he seeks to harm our homes. And for the next few moments, as we conclude this year and the theme of our year entitled The Family Fortress, let's talk about some things that harm our families. There are five of them that I want us to mention in this lesson. Point number one. One thing that harms our homes is a lack of spirituality in our home. When a husband and a wife are joined in holy matrimony, it is not just a union involving two people. It is a union involving three individuals. If two individuals are marriageable, if they are to be lawfully married then God is also involved in that process. He is, in essence, the individual who literally ties the knot between those two people. Jesus made mention of that in Matthew 19.9, or Matthew 19.6. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Folks, God is the one who joins a husband and a wife in holy matrimony. If that be the case, is it not common sense that if our marriage is going to be successful, that we need to continue to have Jesus Christ in our homes? He needs to be evidenced in the life of that husband and of that wife. They need to be individuals who are constantly striving to live like Jesus every day. We see it evidenced also in Bible study, in the home, in prayer. In that family coming to worship the Almighty God and in their daily service within the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
My friends, if a home is not growing, if a home is not being nurtured in spirituality, that home is destined to fail. We see a broad example of that in the church at Corinth, do we not? The Bible says that the church is the family of the living God, according to 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. But if I tarry long, Paul wrote, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. What we have right here at Eastwood is a spiritual home, a spiritual family. And that family is likened to our physical families. When Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, one of the problems that the church was having was low spirituality. In fact, Paul says that these individuals were not spiritual, but rather they were very carnal in their mindset. Notice what he writes, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able." For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Notice what Paul says. Paul says, you have been Christians for quite a period of time, but you have not grown. You are lacking in your spirituality. You are not spiritual people. You are not mature individuals. You are not full-grown individuals in Christ. The only thing that I can feed you with is milk. And because of your carnality, there is envy and strife and divisions among you. Folks, he's talking to the spiritual family of God. And he tells them, because there is a lack of spirituality in this congregation, there is ending and strife and fighting and division and confusion within the congregation. If we find homes that are lacking in spirituality, those homes are going to struggle without Jesus Christ. There's going to be the ending. There's going to be the fighting. There's going to be the division among the two individuals in that home. God wants our homes to be based solidly and squarely upon His Word. He wants to be included in every decision and in everything that goes on in that home. And if it is just shallow, or if it is lacking, there are going to be problems therein. Here's something that's interesting. One individual can be strong in the home and the other individual be lacking in spirituality and that home is still going to struggle, isn't it? There's going to constantly be a battle between the individual who is strong and the individual who is immature. And those homes oftentimes are not successful and fail. Point number two. Another problem that we have with our homes is a lack of what I refer to as intentionality. When you look up the little word intentional, it says this. To plan. To create by purpose. To create by design. To live with a decision in mind. With an end in mind. Don't many individuals live with intentionality in their lives? I love to see a young person in school who is intentional. Don't you? A young person who says, you know, I really do need to make good grades. And they're focused and you can tell it. They study like crazy. They make certain that they make good grades on tests. They prepare for those big college entrance tests. You ask them what their grade point is, and now for some reason you can have a four point something grade point average. You ask them what they've made on their ACT. Oh, I've made a 30, 31, 32, and your mouth just drops open. 
You see, these individuals are focused. I want to do well in school. I want to get a scholarship. I want to go to college. I want to be the best individual that I can possibly be scholastically. And they are focused on that. I like to watch an individual who is involved in a sport live with some intentionality, don't you? I love to see a young person who's involved in football and he says, you know, I'm going to make the very best running back that I can possibly make. I'm going to be the best linebacker that this team has ever seen. I'm going to be the best defensive back that Henry County has ever known. And they live with intentionality. They work hard. They train hard. They work out in the off-season. They run in the off-season. Their minds are filled with football because they are living with focus. They are living with intentionality. I see individuals do it even in their businesses, don't they? I'm going to be the very best individual in my business that I can possibly be. I'm going to set all the sales records that I can possibly set. Individuals are going to have to use me for the standard in my occupation. My business is going to be the one that shines above all the others that are out there. Folks, every day, individuals live with intentionality in their lives. But here's my question. How many of us honestly live with intentionality when it comes to our marriages one with another? How many young people, when they're about to get married and they're standing there on the altar, looking at one another, have this in mind as they look? You know, I love this woman, and we're about to be pronounced husband and wife. And I'm going to be the best husband that I can possibly be every day of my life. How many women look across at the man and say, you know, I'm about to be this man's wife. I'm about to pledge to him my undying love and devotion. And I'm going to be the best wife that I can possibly be. There's not going to be another wife who outshines me, who outdoes the way that I do. The Bible tells us how we are to live in a husband-wife relationship. Husbands... Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5 verse 25. How many of us as husbands wake up and say, you know, I'm going to love my wife today just like Christ loves the church. I'm going to love her self-sacrificially. Even if I have to lay down my life for her, I will be willing to do that. And that's the focus of your life. That's the focus of your day. Folks, I don't know about you, but I'll confess, that is not the way I rise and think when it comes to my marriage. How many women arise every day and say, you know, I'm going to be the best wife to him that I can possibly be. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She shall do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Proverbs 31, 11 and 12. How many women really arise every morning and say, You know what? There's not going to be another wife on the face of this earth that outshines me today. I'm going to be the best wife that I can be. Folks, we're talking about living with intentionality. You see, most of the time we just sort of get up and go through our day without thinking about it, don't we? We get in our ruts, we get into our patterns, and it's very difficult sometimes for us to get out of those things. And when you really stop, and if you really are honest about it, here's what you think. You know, it's hard to live intentionally as a husband or a wife. And it is. 
It takes devotion. It takes effort. It takes time. It takes knowledge to be the very best husband or wife that a person can possibly be. And because of the enormity of the task, sometimes we might think, you know, it's just too hard. You know, can we not just arise in the morning, give one another a hug and a kiss, and maybe sit down for about five minutes, read a passage of Scripture, and have a prayer? Is that too hard? Is it too hard maybe to do just an extra chore or two around the house to help out just a little bit? Is it really too difficult to say, you know, I don't really like doing some of the things that he likes to do, but I think I will? Just get up one morning, women. At about 3.30 in the morning, dressed to go out to the duck blind. He may not go. And you still win. You know, I know men don't always like to go to the opera. I don't like that stuff. Don't want to hear all that singing. But guys, just do something sometimes that we know our mate likes to do that we don't like to do. Schedule time to be with one another. This is the day, this is the night that we are together and there is nothing other than blood or death that will cause us not to meet that night and have a date out. Folks, we've got to start living intentionally in our marriages rather than haphazardly and just going it all alone without any plan or without any design. And that's exactly how many people live in their marriages. Point number three. Another thing that harms our marriages is that we are just trying to do far, far too many things. Life's busy, isn't it? If there were one word that could describe the American society, it would be busyness. We're always busy. If we have to stop and try to work something in somewhere, we just about go crazy, do we not? Oftentimes, because we have to stop and do a little something else, we get angry about it. I just don't have time to do this. But we do it. Isn't that one of the reasons that we love the holidays? Everybody just sort of stops and takes time to be with family, don't they? I've been amazed that individuals have referred to funerals as the new family reunions. And it's true, isn't it? Someone passes away and all the family stops because we have to. And all the family gets together. People you haven't seen since the last funeral are there. And so you get to catch up on the five years in between. And while you're there, everybody says this. You know what? We really need to get together more than we do, but we don't, do we? And we let another five years pass before family gets together. Does the Bible say anything about time? Oh, It has a lot to say about time. Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Psalm 90 verse 12. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. Folks, let me tell you something. We don't have much time with anybody on this earth. Even if you live to be a hundred years old, you don't have much time. And our husband or our wife ought to be the individual that we desire to spend time with. And we need to do everything we can in order to make some time for ourselves in our schedules. 
There's three things homes would never hurt to get rid of. And we never will. TVs, computers, and cell phones. Because those things literally consume our time. Even when we are together, we think we have to be doing almost all three of those things at the very same time, don't we? Folks, we need to get rid of some of that stuff. It's fun just to get together and play some games sometime, isn't it? It's fun to find a family activity that everybody enjoys. Whether it's camping, whether it's... Sailing on the water, whether it's fishing, hunting, whatever it is, everybody enjoys. And get away from all the stuff and just be together as a husband and a wife. And if you have children with those children, folks, time is going to come to an end. And once it's gone, you cannot ever bring it back. It's an impossibility. And we are far, far too busy. And we are harming our homes in the process. Point number four. Another thing that harms our homes is poor communication. I've talked about this in times past. The thing about poor communication is this. There's just so much to talk about when it comes to poor communication. You could spend hours on communication. Let me ask you a question. Has God communicated to His people? Absolutely. Absolutely. God who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. Ephesians, or Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2. Folks, God has chosen to communicate to us through words. So God knows exactly how important it is to speak properly and He knows how important it is to hear properly. Write down these words. Speak, hear, words, listen. And you go home today and you look up those words in a concordance and you see how much God has to say about communication and you will be overwhelmed by what you learn. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, the Bible says this, There is that speaketh that is like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. He talks about two kinds of communication in that one verse. He says there's some communication, there are some words that are spoken that are just like a sword stuck into the heart of a man in order to kill. And yet there are other words that men speak that bring health to the individual. You see, two kinds of talk that you and I can be involved in. One positive and one extremely, extremely negative. We mentioned that virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, verse 26, makes an interesting statement about her. It says this, She opened her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue, listen to me, in her tongue is the law of kindness. Here is a virtuous woman in the sight of God. And God says, when she speaks... She speaks with wisdom and she speaks with kindness. And apparently, if she doesn't have either one of those to say, she is quiet. Proverbs 8 verse 13. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Do you hear what God just said? God says there's some things that you need to hear. One of the things that you and I desperately need to hear is the instruction of His words. Because it provides wisdom to mankind. He says, hear instruction. There comes a time when you and I have to shut our mouths and open our ears to what is being said. Because it's important. 
And that's true even in our relationships, is it not? Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. James 1 verse 19. God knows exactly what He's talking about when He talks about the communication process. And He tells us exactly how to speak and He tells us how you and I should hear even within our marriages. Here's the way we hear sometimes. We don't hear at all. Do we? We just don't listen, period. Another way we hear is like this. We hear selectively. We hear what we want to hear and we don't hear what we don't want to hear. Sometimes we listen just enough so that we can speak. Don't we? We get the first few words... And then all of a sudden, before the person is finished, we are running over him, talking already. Because I think I know what they're already going to say before they've finished saying it. A wizard, apparently. There's some individuals who don't know when to shut up. They just talk all the time and talk and talk and talk and talk. Some people need to get a tape recorder. And they need to punch record. And they need to record for an hour. And then they need to go back and listen to it. They will be overwhelmed at how much they talk. You're kidding. I talk that much? Yeah. Unbelievable. The way some individuals talk. What about the blame game when it comes to our speaking? You did this. You do that. You don't do that. You, 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 you. Folks, it'll destroy a marriage. Fault finding, criticizing. I heard you talked about that in Bible class. Folks, that's a wonderful thing. We need to talk about that. I've got faults. And it's easy to find them. And guess who knows them better than anybody? Kathleen. Yeah, you can find them and you can point them out all you want to. And just destroy an individual in the process. Folks, sometimes we talk without knowledge, don't we? We have no clue of the facts, but we're going to talk about it. So oftentimes we talk out of our feelings rather than out of rationale. Folks, that will destroy a conversation. Because everything has to do with how I feel about it has nothing to do with what's the truth about the matter. And it happens in families all the time. What we need are good classes to teach ourselves about the communication process. And folks, here's what's interesting. Even after you've taken a thousand of them, we'll still have trouble in communication. And yet one counselor said that communication is the lifeblood of a relationship. And how true that is. And we do it so poorly. Point number five. Another thing that harms our homes is just sheer stubbornness in our homes. I looked up the word stubborn and it had two different definitions and yet most of the time when you see a stubborn person, both definitions apply. The first definition said this, a person who is set or fixed in his opinion. Stubborn. The second one said this, an individual who is hard to suppress and hard to control. Stubborn. And isn't it true when you see a stubborn person, you see a person who falls into both categories. They're fixed in their opinion and there ain't no control in them. And they just about drive you crazy. And what's interesting is, you can have in a home a stubborn woman and a stubborn man. Both of us can be just as stubborn, can't we? Nobody's ever been that way. Not Christians. But you go to the Bible and guess what? There's a bunch of them. Was Pharaoh a stubborn man? Unbelievably so, wasn't he? Who is the Lord that I should obey His voice? I know not the Lord. Neither will, I let Pharaoh, neither will I let Israel go, he says. Stubborn. Obstinate. Exodus chapter 5, 1 and 2. What about an old man by the name of Nabal? 
married to a beautiful woman by the name of Abigail. I don't know how he got her. It must have been an arranged marriage. But you go to 1 Samuel chapter 25 and he is described as a curlish person. Curlish. That's a wonderful word to use in an argument though. Husbands, when your wives are being a little bit stubborn, you can just look at her and say, you're being a little curlish there, darling. When you get up off the floor, you can apologize. <laughs> but the word curlish means obstinate. An individual who has their opinion fixed, and that's what Nabal was. I'm a stubborn, obstinate man. And he just stood in opposition to everything. Diotrephes, an old stubborn man, was he not? Third John, verse 9. Love to have the preeminence. And there wasn't anybody going to change his opinion about anything. He was going to be right every time. Even if it involved the Apostle John. But you see, that's three men. But there were some women who were pretty stubborn too. There's one word to define one stubborn woman and it's this. Jezebel. That's one stubborn woman. You turn over to 2 Kings verse 15, chapter 15 and you find out that Jezebel had slain many of the prophets of God. Why? Because she wanted it her way. She wanted all the prophets to prophesy only smooth things to her. So she just killed all the faithful prophets of God so that she could have her way about things. Stubborn woman. Proverbs 7.11 describes the harlot. The woman of the streets, the strange woman. And one of the descriptions is this. She is stubborn in her ways. Stubborn women, stubborn men. As I was thinking about being stubborn, there is an opposite of that, isn't there? And it's the individual who is selfless. You see, to be stubborn is selfish. I want what I want, regardless. It's going to be my way or the highway. If you don't do things the way I want them done, then there are going to be consequences to pay. Boy, how many times have households been filled with those kind of attitudes? And yet the Bible says that charity seeketh not her own. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Paul says in Philippians, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Look not every man upon his own things, but every man also upon the things of others. Chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. You see, stubbornness in our homes takes away selflessness and brings problems Therein. Over the last week or two, we've been in what is known as a gift giving season, haven't we? We give gifts to those we love, we give gifts to those that maybe are involved in our lives in certain ways. And here's what's interesting the best thing. That any of us could give to our homes is a strong, stable, secure marriage. Isn't that true? That's the best gift that we could possibly give. And folks, it doesn't cost anything to do it. But it does take some intentionality on our parts. God didn't give us homes and marriages so that we'd be miserable individuals. Folks, He gave those to us to make us better people, to give us assistance here in this life, and to encourage us to live in such a way that we'll have eternal life in the life to come. Let's strengthen our homes. Be aware of the dangers. Be aware of the problems that Satan brings. And let's fight against them with every fiber of our being so our homes remain strong. My friend, maybe you're not a Christian. This coming, month, uh, this coming Friday, 
It's going to be the first of the year, isn't it? It's time to make some decisions. And you don't need to wait a week to do that. You need to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ today. And the steps are simple. If you believe in the Christ, will repent of your sins, confess the precious name of Jesus, and then be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of sins, you can arise out of the waters of baptism forgiven and added to the family of God. The question is, why wait? Why wait? Dear Christian, where are you spiritually? Maybe you need to stop and maybe you really need to take account of where your life is when it comes to your relationship with God. It's so easy to think that we're close and yet be very, very distant because of sin and iniquity in our lives. Do you need to repent of something? Maybe you have struggling with a problem and you need the prayers of this congregation. It's a family and we need to pray with you and for you if we can. Do you need to respond once you come as we stand and sing?